So what I'm holding in my hand here is a time capsule. It might look to you guys just like a jar of beets, kind of a murky jar. But in here, when I look at it, I see my grandma, I see my grandpa, I see a covered wagon, Amerigo Vespucci, he's in there too. Um, I see a samurai soldier and some pickled plums. So I'm going to tell you how these all got there. But I also want to tell you that this jar is really special to me for another reason. I made this jar of pickled beets when I was 12 years old <laughs> in 4-H in Reno County, Kansas. And the reason that this jar still exists and that I have it today is because of this guy, Rex McGugan, AKA Grandpa Rex. And for whatever reason, Grandpa Rex decided that he wanted to keep this jar of pickles, which is over 20 years old now, um, and keep it in the back of his pantry. And my mom finally unearthed it a year or so ago, and she laughed and she you know, said, well, why would he ever keep it that long? That's crazy. And then I reminded her of her jar of green maraschino cherries that she famously kept in the refrigerator in our basement for over 10 years. And we have documented evidence of this, and we know this because my brothers and I, after high school, we would go back every year, and it became a game. Check the fridge. Are the green cherries still there? Yeah, they're still there. Next year, they're still there. This went on for 10, probably 12 years, and we finally confronted her and said, Mom, what is the deal with the cherries? And she laughed, and she said, Oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I thought you kids would want them someday. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'd need them for something. And, you know, we, we still make fun of her for that, but I, honestly, I can't laugh too hard because if you ask my roommate Jessica, she would probably tell you that there are a few specimens in our refrigerator that are pretty close to uh, the kind of things that my mom and my grandpa would keep. So I guess that goes all, all goes to say that uh, hoarding food runs in my family. <laughs> But you know, it's not that surprising, really, because I come from seven generations of farmers. And so when you think about it, for farmers, it's essential to keep your food beyond the seasons. You need to have your crops, but you also need to find a way to keep them and preserve them throughout the year. And one of the ways that people have found to do that over time is through pickling. So I'm just going to give you a little 101, two different ways to make a pickle. The first is lacto-fermentation. And this is what, how you get your sauerkraut and your kimchi. You're basically adding a little salt to the vegetable, chopping it up, and then letting it create its own lactic acid, which ferments and forces out all the bad bacteria and keeps an acidic environment so no new bad bacteria can grow. The second is the more um, modern, common version, vinegar brining. And that's when you put a vinegar mixture over the, pickle, or over the vegetables and let it sit. And what that does is the acid kills the bad bacteria and the heat kills it, but it also kills everything. So you don't get any of the good stuff, the good bacteria in there. So through these two methods, you get things like your cucumber dills, your sauerkraut, your kimchi, and as I learned last fall when I had 30 pounds of persimmons that I had no idea what to do with, you can actually pickle persimmons. <laughs> so through all these processes, as I talked about, acid is important, but the other really important ingredient is time. Basically, acid plus vegetables plus time equals your pickles. Now, it's important because you can't just take some cabbage, chop it up, put it on your counter, and leave it out and get a pickle. I mean, you just get a stinky kitchen, right? So. But if you took that same cabbage and chopped it up and let it sit for 30 days and let it ferment, you'd get not only a delicious sauerkraut, but you'd also get all those beneficial microorganisms in there. So that, the only difference there is time. The other thing that's really interesting about time and pickling is that when you pickle something, you're, crea you're, you're creating something for the future, right? You're not going to eat it right then. And when you eat a pickle, you're actually eating something from the past. So just with the very act of creating a pickle and eating a pickle, you're, you're playing with time itself. And when you think about it, it's the ability to do this, to take food out of its normal life cycle and put it aside, that allowed us to explore and expand and leave the places that you know, we knew we had grocery stores, we knew we had gardens and crops, and go westward and live places that we didn't know it was out there. We had to bring food with us. So through that process, we got to places like Nebraska, like Wyoming, like Texas, and like Dodge City, Kansas, where I was born. And one of the things that interests me is that, of course, it didn't start there, right? It didn't start, pickling didn't start with the westward expansion. 
If you go back to this guy, does anybody know who this is? Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. Amerigo Vespucci, right. And so he is known as an explorer, and this is the guy who gave our country its name. But before he was an explorer, he was also a merchant. And so when the ships were going out, he would outfit them with provisions, and he would give them all the food they needed for the journey. And do you know what one of the main, main things he put on those ships was? Pickles. <laughs> That's right. So he would send those ships out with fermented cabbage and sour, or sorry, fermented cabbage and cucumbers because A, they weren't going to spoil on the, voy on the long voyage, and B, they had a lot of vitamin C. And scurvy was a huge problem at that time. So sending something out with a lot of vitamin C actually helped make sure that half the crew didn't die um, on the voyage, which was a, a big problem back then. But again, it's not like the Europeans invented pickling. We can go back further. Let's go back to, say, 13th century Japan. Samurai. He looks fierce. He's got his battle gear. He's got a samurai sword. But he also had another secret weapon on the battlefield. And I bet you can guess what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Now, technically, it wasn't a cucumber pickle. It was a pickled plum, uh, also known as an umeboshi. But I don't know if you've ever tried to Photoshop an umeboshi onto a samurai. It didn't come out well, so we're going to go with this. And the samurai would eat the pickles on the battlefield because they thought that it gave them strength. Um, they thought it helped them uh, relieve battle fatigue and helped them keep from getting sick. It was even said that if a samurai was fallen on the battlefield, if he just waved an umeboshi in front of his nose, he would start to salivate, and it would revive him. So clearly, it was very important to the culture of the samurai. And I had the privilege of getting to taste one of these special umeboshi that was made in 1969, a few weeks ago, thanks to this woman. This is Yoko Kondo. She is, well, she doesn't call herself the queen of umeboshi, but I call her that. She runs a restaurant in the Mission in San Francisco called Minako. And if you ever go to Monaco, I highly recommend that you go to the bathroom. Because when you go, you'll pass through her pickle pantry. It's a very small restaurant. And in there, she's got all of these umeboshi. I don't know if you can see the, the, the tags on there. There's one in 1979, 2006, 2010. And the one that I tasted, like I said, was 1969. I saw one in there from 1937. And she explained to me how the longer you keep them, the more medicinal they become, and they have more properties that make them, therefore, more expensive. So we were chatting, you know, pickler to pickler, and I asked, I asked Yoko how she learned all this, and she said that she learned from her grandma. And she talked about when the ume trees were ripe in June, how the whole village would go out and pick them, and then bring them back, and salt them, and pack them, and it was a very communal process. And it sounded so familiar to me, because that's exactly how I learned. Now, I also think it's interesting that uh, Yoko's restaurant is in the Mission in San Francisco, which is kind of the heart of you know, all the hipness and the nowness and, and things like that. Because I don't know if you guys have noticed, but pickles are blowing up. <laughs> pickles are like everywhere now. Okay, Everybody's talking about pickles. There's, you can even get a, a shot of Jameson with a pickle back, which is you drink pickle brine after it. And for whatever reason, culturally, the, the, the tides that rise and fall have brought pickles into the forefront right now. All right, thanks for coming. I sold everything but these cucumbers. Now what am I going to do? We can pickle that! Hi, I'm Bryce Shivers. And I'm Lisa Eversman. And, and we, we can, can pickle, pickle that! that. Oh my god, these chickens are laying so many eggs, I'm freaking out. We, we can, can pickle, pickle that. that! We did it. Pickled eggs. Pickles always cost a nickel. We can pickle that. We can pickle anything. Everything should be pickled. So, I have to admit that I'm part of this uh, phenomenon, uh, spreading the word about pickling. I teach classes in San Francisco um, to young urban people who want to learn how to pickle that. And it's fascinating because when I teach these classes, one of the first questions that I always get when we're going through the process is, OK, so how soon can I eat my pickles? And I tell them, you know, wait a week, two weeks, a month is best. And then I watch their faces fall. <laughs> because they want to do this old-timey slow thing, but they want to do it really, you know, they want to have the, the instant gratification at the end. And I think that's exactly sort of you know, speaks to our really complicated relationship with time right now. And maybe that's what it is about the pickle. Because when you're making it, 
you're engaging in the present and you're taking time out of your day to do a slow process, a process that's been around for a while, but then you don't get to eat it right then. You have to suspend that time and wait for it. And at the same time, when you make something that's pickled, you are suspending time. You're taking something, putting it into a jar, taking it out of its normal life cycle and leaving it there. This is my grandma, Grandma Harriet McVicker. And she did a lot of pickling, but it wasn't because it was cool or trendy or something that she did to relax. She did it because she lived on a farm. Uh, she was managing a farm with my grandfather 20 miles from the nearest town, raising four kids. And so every day she had to feed them, plus whoever, whichever farm hands happened to be around. This is the farm. And so as you can see, like there's not a lot around. She couldn't go to the store to get a jar of tomatoes or pick up some milk. And so for her, it was about efficiency and it was about feeding the family in a very practical way. And I think it's really funny, it's a juxtaposition, because for me, when I make pickles, it's about taking that time out and reconnecting with my family and sort of enjoying the process of um, the method of it, and, and I find it meditative. I didn't always feel this way, though. It's not like, oh, I grew up with this uh, tradition, and now you know I've just been doing it forever. But, uh, not too long after I made that jar of beets, I kind of turned away from all this stuff. I grew up in a family with two brothers. I was the only girl. And it always felt very much like those things were expected, or it was assumed that I would be the one in the kitchen with, the, with grandma and the aunts. And so I sort of rejected that, and it just didn't feel right, and it felt like I, you know, I wanted to, to explore other things and do other things. Uh, so when I was 18, I left Kansas, and I moved to Spain for a year. And then I lived all over um, the, the country and in different countries. And I don't think I've been back to Kansas for more than two weeks at a time since then. And my brothers and I own a little bit of farmland in western Kansas where my grandparents used to farm. And so we go back there from time to time. And I have a lot of good memories and I find a lot of peace there, but I don't ever see myself living there. And, you know, if I'm really honest, this has been kind of tough for my family. Um, we haven't always been that close about it because they see it as a rejection. They see the fact that I've moved away, I've experienced different things as a rejection of, of what they raised me with. And now as I've come back around and, and sort of come back to these traditions that I grew up with, I realize that in a way I'm kind of a pickle. Like it took me that time to ferment. I took the long fermentation process, not the quick brine. And now I'm coming back to all of it right at this time. And, you know, I think my parents probably would have preferred the quick brine. They would have preferred that I was, you know, making the pickles and making the babies and all of that, but, you know, 10 years ago. But I think it's fascinating that I came back to all this stuff exactly at the same time that culturally and as a society, we're kind of becoming more aware of that connection to our food. And we're becoming more aware of what it means to engage with making something with our hands. And so if you ask me, I think the timing is perfect. Uh, I look at this jar of beets, and I see a connection. I see, I see times that I spent with my grandma, and um, the skills, the obvious skills she passed on to me, because we're both champions, I mean, look. <laughs> Not to brag. And then, you know, I look at this jar of beets, and I think it really has been suspended in time, right? This jar doesn't know that I've gone off and I've left Kansas. This jar doesn't know that I've lived in Spain and Mexico and now that I'm in California. I mean, for all it knows, I'm still a 12-year-old wearing way too much hairspray. <laughs> and I kind of like that. I kind of like that suspension in time. So anyway, as I was getting ready to give this speech, I called my mom and I said, Mom, do you, do you still have the green cherries? <laughs> And she said, oh, no, 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 no. I threw those out ages ago. You kids were making fun of me, and I threw them out. But I kept the jar. <laughs> <laughs> and so who knows what will happen with these. Um, it's probably a good thing I can't get them open. I've tried. I would probably, knowing me, I would try to taste them. Um, but I bet you when I finally decide to throw them away, if that history of my family is any, any indication at all, I'm going to be keeping the jar, too. Thank you.